This episode of the Art of Manliness podcast is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is an easy and an affordable way to help individuals and organizations learn. They have basically thousands of online courses created by experts on topics like business, leadership, software, web development, graphic design, photography, videography, you name it, they have it. You pay $25 a month, you get access to all the courses. And right now, they're offering Art of Manliness listeners a seven-day free trial. So if you go to lynda.com slash art of man, you can try lynda.com free for seven days. So that's lynda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash art of man. And now to the show. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Well, I'm excited about today's guest because I'm always excited about our guests, but this one in particular, I've been following this guy's blog since I was in law school. It was a long time ago, six years ago, eight years ago, seven years ago about. Anyways, his name is Cal Newport, and uh, he has a blog called Study Hacks where he uh, writes about you know how to succeed in school. And he's written a whole bunch of books about being an effective, efficient student. So if you're a college age guy or high school age guy, I definitely recommend checking out those books by him. But today we're going to talk about a book that he wrote two years ago called "So Good They Can't Ignore You." And in this book, Cal takes on this advice we see a lot all over the place when it comes to your career. And that advice is if you want to find meaningful work and make lots of money and blah, 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 uh, all you have to do is follow your passion. You find your passion, you follow it. And once you do that, everything will just magically be okay. But he makes the case that that can actually be really bad advice and it can actually lead to frustration and angst and, and, and anxiety about your career. And instead, he looks at what the research says about what gives us or what gives us a feeling of fulfillment in our work and what we can do to cultivate that feeling. Uh, So we're going to talk about that today. And so this is I'm really excited about this is something I think every young person in particular needs to hear. If you if you're in that that point in your life where you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with your career, this this podcast is for you, even if you've been at your career for 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to find some information in here that will I think challenge some of the assumptions you've had, maybe reduce some of the anxiety you've had about your yourself and whether you're in the right job or not, and things that you can do to turn the job you have right now into a job you love and that you're passionate about. It's not about finding, it's about cultivating. We're going to talk more about that right now, so stay tuned. Cal Newport, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. All right, so uh, you've uh, been writing uh, online for a long time now. It's something I've been following for a while. Uh, your Study Hacks blog came in handy for me while I was in law school. And so for any of our listeners who are in college or grad school, definitely recommend you go check out um, Cal's blog for content on studying and planning and things like that. It's super great information. But today we're going to talk about this book that you published back in 2012. That's right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, it was sort of like uh, Martin Luther hammering a his treatise on the the door, because it's sort of an article of faith nowadays that if you want to find meaningful work, you have to follow your passion. And you make the argument in your book so good, they can't ignore you, that that's actually can be really bad advice and can make you miserable. So can you explain why following your passion can possibly make you miserable with your work? Well, the, the first thing to to make clear is that there is a difference between the goal of ending up passionate about what you do for a living and the strategy of following your passion. Now, people often mix those up, but for our conversation, it's very clear that I'm separating these two things because I think the goal of ending up passionate about your work is a fantastic goal. And that book is actually about how do people actually accomplish that. The actual strategy of following your passion, however, I do think reduces the chances that you'll succeed with that goal. It will reduce the probability that you'll end up passionate about your work. And there's really two strikes against it. So the first strike is that it assumes that most people have a pre-existing passion that they can identify and then use as the foundation of career decisions. If you don't have a pre-existing passion, that advice doesn't make any sense. We actually don't have a lot of evidence that most people do. So what's the harm of that advice? Well, if you're like most people, 
and you don't have a pre-existing passion, then if all you've heard is follow your passion and everything will be okay, you're going to be left alone, confused, and anxious. The second strike against this piece of advice is that uh, it's based on this seemingly intuitive syllogism that if you really like something and then do that for your work, that you'll end up really liking your work. But it turns out that we actually don't have a lot of evidence that that's true. If you look at the decades of research on workplace motivation and satisfaction, we see pre-existing interest for your work actually plays a very small uh, if perhaps non-existent role in whether or not you'll actually like that subject, you'll actually like that as a career, that there's many other factors that have nothing to do with a pre-existing match of something you like to your job. There's many other factors that play a much bigger role if your interest is ending up passionate about your work. So again, if all you tell someone is follow your passion, then what happens when they match some strong interest to their work and they don't love it? They're left anxious, they're left confused, they're left frustrated again. So I think this advice is a red herring. It's way too simplistic. Uh, it's a childish look at a very adult topic, which is what's the reality of how people in the real world build true, meaningful passion for their work. Yeah. And another strike it against and you kind of hit on this in your book as well, is that you might be passionate about something, but like no one wants to pay you money for it, right? Like you can't make a living from it. Like you could be passionate about like uh, there's this guy, Brett Kelly, always talks about, I'm passionate about waffles, but it's kind of hard making money eating waffles for a living. Yeah, that's true. And and even then, even when you're saying that, it's still assuming, okay, but if you could somehow make a living off of it, that you that, that would be good. But we don't even have evidence yeah. that that's true. You know, I, I love craft beer. And even if I could make a living off of it, that pre-existing love for craft beer does not say that I'm going to love doing that for a living. There's plenty of, of passionate amateur bakers and photographers who are miserable when they open professional bakeries or photography studios because passion and work has very, very little to do with, hey, how much did you like the topic that your work deals with ahead of time? Well, what about like all these super successful people, right? That, you know, tell you, oh, you just follow your passion, right? Everyone like around this time, uh, graduation time and starting off school, they, they, everyone's always sharing like the Steve Jobs commencement speech where he's like, follow your passion. Or like you have the guy, Richard Branson, in charge of Virgin, whatever, airlines and records and his empire. It's like, oh, just follow your passion and you'll, you'll make money. Uh, how, what do you, what's your take on those guys? Well, it's true that if you look at in popular culture, at least if you, you think about what you've seen in popular culture, uh, the idea that lots of famous, happy people are advising you to follow your passion, and that does seem true. But I think there's three different things that, that are going on to make that a reality. Uh, the first is a lot of these people are misquoted or misunderstood. So Steve Jobs is the perfect example of that. He said in his 2005 Stanford commencement speech, uh, you know, you should do something that you love. Don't settle for work that you don't love. And people assumed he meant follow your passion. Mm. But that's not actually what he was saying. And we know that for two reasons. One, indirectly, because that's not what he did. Uh, he stumbled into Apple Computer at a time where he clearly had no pre-existing passion for technology entrepreneurship. He developed that passion later in the more complex ways that people do. And two, I uncovered an interview transcript with his biographer, Walter Isaacson, where Isaacson says, yeah, in Steve Jobs' waning years, I asked him specifically about this piece of advice, follow your passion. And Steve Jobs responded, and I'm quoting, this is Isaacson quoting Jobs, uh, it's not all about you and your damn passion. Right? You need to get out there and try to make a dent in the universe. That's what matters. So Steve Jobs was not saying follow your passion. He was misquoted. The, the second factor that goes on in this phenomenon is that uh, a lot of people who end up passionate about what they do make that subtle shift I talked about in the beginning of our interview in which they equate the strategy of following a passion with the goal of ending up passionate about what you do so when the Richard Branchons of the world say, follow your passion, often what they really mean is, hey, you should set the goal of ending up passion, being passionate about your work. You know, Don't sell yourself short. But those are two very different things. Then third, there are some people who do have a clear pre-existing passion. They follow it and things work out. And we happen to hear a lot from them. So I'm not saying this advice never works. Yeah. It's just how, how, uh, how often does it actually work is, is actually pretty rare. So yeah. those, three, those three factors create this whole echo chamber out there in culture where it seems like this is all that people are saying. Gotcha. So it's, it, I guess there's like some uh, survivor bioship and like – what's that called? The fi survivor fallacy? Yeah, or, there's some survivorship bias. And, yeah. And, yeah, but it doesn't matter if an effect exists 
uh, when you're looking at an event space. What matters is what's its frequency. Sure. Okay. So, um, just to be clear, was the recap? We're not saying that you can't be passionate about your work. It's just how you pursue that attainment of passion is sort of flawed. Um, so you make the argument that instead of like following your passion, you should uh, cultivate your passion. Um, and we're going to get into more details, but just very, very broadly. I mean, what does the research say out there that you know we what things we can do to d- cultivate a passion in our work? So the type of factors we know from the research that lead to a sense of passion for your work include uh, a sense of autonomy, a sense of competence or mastery, uh, a sense of connection to people or a mission, uh, a sense of impact, and a sense of creativity. General traits like those lead people to feel passionate about your work. So broadly speaking, your goal should be to maximize those type of traits in your working life and passion will follow. And I mean, this is something that's, I think, important to point out as well. This doesn't necessarily mean you have to like start your own business and become an entrepreneur. You can find, be passionate about your work, even if you're working a corporate gig or you're working for a university or a government job. Um, I mean, I guess the research is if you have those type of you know, attributes you listed out, you can develop a passion about your work. Correct. Yeah, and I think that's liberating about this idea is that those traits are quite agnostic to the specific type of work. They really have very little to do with have you matched your work to a pre-existing interest or is it a certain type of work? It just says if you can have these traits at high levels, you will probably have passion for your work, whatever it is. Yeah, I think that is super liberating because I, I know there's like a lot of, you know, because I interact with a lot of young guys and there's like this pressure on them, right? To like, you got to find something that is your life's calling and you have to be your own boss and you have to, um, you know, be location independent and like... And it's, that's a hard thing to do. And they, they just sort of struggle. And yeah, like you said, they feel frustrated and anxious when they can't achieve that. And they, they feel sort of bummed out because they're working, you know, a corporate job, like a a stiff, but you can actually have very, a very fulfilling light work life working that corporate job. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if if you can get autonomy, if you can get competence, great things happen. So I I tell a story in in the book, for example, where I take two uh, corporate advertising executives These are real people uh, who at similar points in their life had this moment of crisis where they're thinking, okay, am I happy? Is this the thing I want to do? One of those executives, and these were sort of junior executives at the time, uh, quit to start a yoga studio. She was saying, well, I love yoga. I'm passionate about yoga. Maybe my problem is advertising is not my passion. Let me go open a yoga studio. The other executive said, "Um, I'm going to find some specialty in here. Uh, that I'm just going to own, that I'm going to dominate because then I'll have more control over my working life and I can get away from the type of stuff I don't like in this job and do more of the stuff that I do like. And what ended up happening to these two people is that the woman who started the yoga studio, uh, that quickly failed because she had no particular high-level expertise in yoga. And in the profile I found about her, at the end, she was uh, waiting in line for food stamps. The guy who worked on his specialty became uh, one of the, the world's experts in international brands. And the profile I found about him talked about how he had this great setup where he had his own essentially autonomous business, but within the umbrella of a larger business. So he didn't have the stress of the risk of running your own shop. And he was talking about the the ski house that they had built where his whole family would come and stay with him for the whole summer on the on this lake in Wisconsin. He had this very fulfilling, happy life. Uh, so it's two people at a fork in the woods. One of them said, I bet I can transform this job into something I love. And the other said, oh, I just got to keep doing something new until I immediately love it. And we see there is a huge difference in the outcome. The person who said, I can make this job into something I love ended up doing much better. We're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Hey, Art of Manliness listeners. One thing that I've become a big believer in is that in this economy, the people who are going to thrive in it are one, self-starters and two, autodidactics, people who can learn on their own. Because the landscape is constantly shifting, you don't know if the career you are in now will be the career you're going to be you know, in 10, 15, 20 years from now. So you constantly have to be updating and learning new skills. And that's why lynda.com is really cool. If you haven't checked it out, it's lynda.com. They have courses taught by experts in fields like business, management, software, web development, videography, photography. I've been doing some of the photography courses because I got this DSLR that I use for the art of manliness when we take pictures. And some of my pictures aren't that great. So I'm hoping to improve with that with Linda. And I'm also some of the stuff on productivity and business. 
been really great to help me with my business on the art of manliness. But again, it's just, it's great stuff. They're taught by experts. It's all online. There's video. It's $25 a month and you get access to all the courses. You can upgrade to a premium account and you'll have access to everything on your smartphone and to transcripts as well. So it's a really cool thing. So if you are wanting to up your game and trying to uh, get get a competitive advantage, I uh, definitely recommend you check out lynda.com. And right now they're offering an exclusive deal for Art of Manliness listeners. You'll get a free trial for seven days. So if you visit lynda.com slash art of man, you'll get Linda free free for seven days. So that's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash art of man. And now back to the show. Yeah. And so this idea of uh, mastery, right? Becoming the best at what you do is kind of where the title of your book came from, right? So good they can't ignore you. Actually, it was Steve Martin, right? Came up with that line. That's, yeah, that was his advice to entertainers wanting to succeed in the entertainment industry. Yeah, and that – you gave those examples. It reminds me a lot of my dad. My, so my dad was a federal game warden, um, which was basically – it was a government job. He was a bureaucrat. Um, during the fall season, he got to go out and like check duck hunters, which, he, which was nice. But for most of the time, he was just like in an office – writing memos, doing paperwork, doing, inter- you know, depositions, you know, just, it was like really boring stuff, but he did it for 35 years, but like he loved his job. And I remember I was, I just, I was just, I was having a, like a frustrating point in my life where I was just like, man, this work is so boring. I don't know how, how can I, how can I find fulfilling work? And I asked my dad, it's like, dad, you've been doing this for 35 years. How do you still love your job? Even though for most of the time you just write papers and write memos. And he says, well, I just take one day at a time and I try to be the best that I can be. And that's why I enjoy what I do. And uh, it's like really simple folksy advice. But like I, when I, once I, as soon as I started applying that, like things turned around for me, it just became a lot, I don't know, it just lifted off this uh, anxiety to find out what my, my calling was. And I just try to focus on what I could do now. Yeah. 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 There's, there's this great interview with uh, Richard Bowles who, who wrote the book, uh, What Color Is Your Parachute? which helped bring in a lot of this thinking because it was one of these first books to say, hey, you got to figure out what you're supposed to do. What color is your parachute? And this great interview he did, uh, I think it was for Fast Company Magazine. He said, when I wrote this book in the 1970s, when I first had this idea that you should sit down and really try to figure out what you're supposed to do, he said people thought it was a dilettante exercise. So our parents' generation, especially our grandparents' generation, none of this would have made any sense to them. Yeah. What do you mean you're sitting down and like really trying to figure <laughs> out like what you're meant to do or not meant to do? You said you were meant to do something. You know, get a good job, do it well, you know, uh, have some pride in your work. It was a, that folksy wisdom, I think, you know, we now see validated with science is actually a much smarter way to build a fulfilling career. All right. So you have uh, in, the, in, your, in one section of your book, you talk about different mindsets of approaching work. Uh, one is the the craftsman mindset and the other is the passion mindset. Uh, can you kind of just briefly explain what the differences are between the two and, and how can you develop a craftsman mindset? Yeah, so the craftsman mindset is where you approach your work asking the question, what value am I bringing to the world? And the passion mindset, by contrast, which is more common these days, is the mindset of asking, what value is this job bringing me? Is this what I'm meant to do? Do I love it? What are they offering me? My argument is that the craftsman mindset is what's going to lead you to work that you love. And the simple framework is this. If you get really good at things, you produce real value for the world, you will gain more control over your working life. If you have more control over your working life, you can steer it towards those traits like autonomy and impact and connection and mission uh, that we know lead people to really love their work. You connect those two things together, it says if you have a craftsman mindset, you're more likely to end up loving what you do for a living. Gotcha. And the passion mindset, you're just going to keep shopping, right? You're going to keep shopping. Yeah. Yeah. And you're never going to be satisfied. And I want to say, I think the key, uh, the key, there's two, if I had to summarize everything I'm saying down to like two key points of what I found, I mean, I think the first key point is that traits like autonomy and impact and mission is what matters. And the second key point, is that those traits are rare and they're valuable. They're hard to get. People don't just give them away. It's hard in our economy to have a job that has great autonomy or gives you a great sense of mastery or or, or mission or connection. Uh, Therefore, the glue that holds these ideas together is you have to have something valuable to offer in return. And that's why my book is so centered on you need to have a craftsman mindset. You need to get really good at something. It's not because just being good at something by itself 
means you'll love your work. It's that that is your leverage mm. to get these rare and valuable traits into your life. You have to have something to offer in return. And in the job economy, that's your skills. You know, So you have to get good, step one. And then step two, you have to use that as leverage to make sure that you can get lots of autonomy and uh, mastery and these other traits in your working life. That's my sort of simple formula that replaces follow your passion. Yeah. It re- reminds me of, um, what's that guy's name? D- writes the Marginal Revolution blog. He has that book, yeah, Average is Tyler, Over. Tyler Cowan, yeah. Yeah, his whole, yeah, Average is Over, right? Like, it's, if you want to be a success in today's economy, like, you have to be so good that they can't ignore you. Yeah, and, and it's not that that uh, just being really good means you'll love your work, yeah. but it's that's your foundation. Without that foundation, if you just run around saying, do I love this, do I love that, you know, the answer is going to be no. Yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> one is handing out <laughs> – Sure. Like the economy is not going to say, oh, you want to just sort of, you know, work from home with a web business and, and within a month be making a great salary and live all over the world. The market <laughs> says, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's an incredibly brutal economy. What are you doing that's excellent? And, then, you know, it takes a long time to get good at things. So this craftsman mindset uh, is really the first step towards towards realizing those goals. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to point out, too. It takes a long time. So I feel like a lot of young people, they want to just right out the bat have a salt, like a, an awesome career. Um, but it, that can take, um, years to develop decades. Uh, yeah. Which is even. why it's so dangerous to just tell people, follow your passion, because if you emphasize the match is all that matters, then people expect the rewards as soon as they make the match. In other words, they will be conditioned to expect to love their work on the first day at the job if they chose the right job. And that's so far from reality that you're really setting up a whole generation for chronic anxiety and job hopping. Yeah. So yeah, I like this idea that you talk about as far as, you know, having that craftsman mindset of developing career capital. Um, and I think, um, what's her name? I talked to her. She wrote um, something about 20 something. So I forgot her name. Anyway, she has something like a identity capital, but I like your, I like career capital because it applies to work. Uh, can you talk about like what career capital is? Yeah, that's the metaphor I use to make it easier to think about this uh, strategy of mine. So if the strategy is get good, and then use that as leverage to gain desirable traits in your working life. Uh, the metaphor that helps you visualize that is this notion that uh, as you build up increasingly rare and valuable skills, you uh, gain more of this fictitious quantity that I call career capital. And just like monetary capital, you can then invest it as you grow it into the traits that are going to give you real returns in your life. So if you want um, a really desirable trait in your working life, such as you completely decide on your own what you work on and when, that's going to require a lot of career capital. So what you have to do is say, how much capital do I have? Oh, I don't have very much. I'm new to this job. I don't have much skill. So what I need to do is build up my supply of career capital until I have enough to exchange for this trait. So it just gives you a sense of uh, an easier way to measure where you are and where you need to get in order to make these career moves. So career capital includes things like, I mean, it even includes like college, right? And things you might be doing in college right now. Um, and then internships you might have right after college. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so you can start building it right away. That's why, uh, uh, if you've majored in a specific topic, uh, all things being equal, why does it make sense to try to get a job in that field? Well, it's because you already have a small foundation of career capital. So because you have some skills interning and majoring in that field. It doesn't mean that you have to. It doesn't mean that's the only field that you can be happy in. Career capital theory gives you this much more grounded way to think about things. Oh, all things being equal, I already have some skills in this area. That that reduces the amount of additional skills I need to build and sort of the, before I can start getting good things. So it, it, when you apply it to a lot of different paradoxes or quandaries in career thinking – this sort of simple metaphor actually often simplifies what the right answer is. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I also like the point you kind of brought up in your book is that you can develop career capital and you should find ways to um, use that career capital you developed. Like, so if you majored in uh, computer science, well, it's obvious that computer science is what you should do. But what I think is interesting too is sort of how broad career capital is. is like as you develop a major or as you earn a major in computer science or whatever – else you major, might major in, you're developing other skills as well that could be applied into, I guess, uh, other fields that are closely to related to computer science, but not directly computer science, if that makes sense. Like, I, I, like, for example, I went to law school, but I don't practice law, but I learned a lot of skills um, during law school, such as writing and research and how to think analytically. 
um, that I've been able to kind of use in my my career. Um, and I, I, I guess I, I mean, all those people always ask me, like, do you regret going to law school? And it's like, well, it's, I mean, I guess I in a way I do, but in a way I don't because I developed some skills that came in handy later on, or at least I found how to how, how to use those skills. Yeah, I think that's a great point that uh, we're used to thinking about career in terms of these broad level of categorizations, you know, industry and job and career capital thinking gets you uh, focused on specific skills and you break them out of these really loaded, you know, high level categories like lawyer or law school. And instead you say uh, writing, how to do intense, deep research quickly, uh, the type of traits that we see, is, for example, in the, sort of the standard classic art of manliness post. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think that's really helpful because uh, it, it allows you to make uh, transitions, for example, from a particular industry maybe to another one in a very smart way because yeah. you can see, okay, I, maybe I don't like um, law as an industry, but if I can identify my skills and, and have some sense of how good I am at different specific skills, you can find uh, other industries where those apply and prevent yourself from having to start over from scratch. Yeah. And I, I think well, as I was reading that section, one thing I brought up uh, or one thing that brought, came to my mind was you often hear these, um, you know, stories of guys who, you know, founded some company that allows them to like live the dream, right? Travel around the world. And, you know, they, they talk about how they, you know, regret going to college or like, you know, you shouldn't go to college and they advocate going to college because I didn't graduate from college. I dropped out. Look at me. I'm still a success. And the thing that I've always pointed out, or I've always thought of, usually the guys who are talking about this sort of thing, like they got into Princeton or they got into yeah. Harvard yeah. Um, and then they dropped out and it's like, they probably, because they got into Princeton or Harvard, they developed like career capital that, um, allowed them to drop out and still be a success. Yes. And they often had around the massive investment in, in their company yeah. before they dropped out. You know, no one, I'm not impressed about Bill Gates dropping out of Harvard. I mean, he, he, he had been there for a couple of years and his company was obviously had huge potential. It wasn't a super bold, risky move. But yeah, I agree with you. There was often a great potential for them to get in there in the first place. And they often then worked really, really hard while there to build up the specific skills that they used in their company. And also a lot of people drop out of college and uh, it's a terrible decision. Yeah. So we really got to worry about survivorship bias. There's, there's a lot of career capital that is built in college uh, that is hard to build without it. Yeah. So yeah, I guess people who are listening, you know, if you hear people say, don't go to college, you know, think twice, you know, don't just take it on the face value, look into it a little bit deeper, I guess is the, is the word of wisdom there. All right. So, um, you talked about mastery, um, autonomy is a big part of cultivating work you love or control. And, um, I think many, most people like intuitively understand this, like they want, you know, if they, they'd be happier if they were, they were their own boss. So they want to become entrepreneurs. They want to become, you talk about people who want to become farmers, um, in Vermont, uh, yes. Yeah, it's funny. So my wife and I, we love Vermont. Like we go there every summer. And that's kind of the big joke amongst Vermonters is that you have all these people from Manhattan who are burnt out and they decide, I'm going to become a farmer and life's oh, yeah. going to be wonderful. And they're a complete failure. Yeah. Um. So so let's talk about those Vermont, those, those New York banker turned Vermont farmers. Uh, why do they fail? I mean, they're successful bankers. Um, why can't they cut it in farming and why can't they have control of their life by being a farmer? Right. So it is, uh, as you point out there, the appeal of farming. And I, and I, I spent some time with some of these farmers in writing this book to, to try to understand this. The, the appeal of this lifestyle is for the most part, the autonomy, which our intuition and research tells us the, you have this autonomy over what you do and why that's incredibly beneficial. So that's what draws, you know, the burnt out cliche, Wall Street stockbroker to buy the farm uh, in New York or in Vermont is that that drive for sort of more autonomy. Uh, career capital thinking allows us to really understand what's going on here because career capital thinking tells us that yes, autonomy is very valuable. Because of that, it is expensive in career capital terms. So you have to have a lot of relevant skills and value to offer in return. So what happens if you quit your uh, banking job to go start a, a farm in Vermont? The issue is you made a move for autonomy. You tried to buy autonomy before you had any relevant capital to invest mm. in it. So you're not really able to obtain it, and therefore you fail to actually build up a, a sustainable lifestyle in which you have that trait. So I contrasted that in my book with a very successful farmer from 
uh, Western Massachusetts. And I said, let's actually look at this guy's background. This guy has about a decade of honing the skills relevant to farming, including a degree in vegetable horticulture from Cornell Ag School uh, and years of leasing farmland, at small tracts of land, and, and, and uh, about a decade of experience before he took on his first major mortgages and bought his first farm. I said, that's how people become successful farmers. They build up the career capital first that they need in order to successfully gain an autonomous, successful life as a farmer. Yeah. And that, the whole section about um, how we have like this kind of like courage culture online in particular, yeah. where it says like the only thing that's holding you back from being your own boss is you like, you're just, you're, you're afraid. Yeah. And there's a whole industry out there designed to help you not be afraid to make that plunge into, you know, being, being your own boss. And uh, you talk about like lifestyle design folks in your book and like, I guess bloggers are in that kind of, uh, that realm. And I get a lot of people cause like, you know, I make it, that's what I do. I make it my living writing the art of manliness. And so a lot of people think, Oh wow, this is pretty easy. If I can just like write some post about something that I like, then I can eventually quit my, my job. And like, I tell them, no, it's like, it's actually harder than that. Like I've, it took me years to get to that point. Um, I don't, I mean, yeah, it's just it, that, that, that point really resonates. I see a lot of people who they like the idea of like, having a blog that just magically makes money and then they can go wherever in the world and everything's be fine. But like, it doesn't usually work out that way. Yeah. And I think career capital thinking really helps clarify this issue once again, because uh, yeah, people want to, to travel the world and make a living off of a blog because that would give them, you know, again, incredible autonomy. That autonomy always comes back. Uh, but it, autonomy as we keep seeing <laughs> is very valuable. It's hard to get. You have to have a lot of relevant rare and valuable skills to offer in return. And that's why, as you point out, I'm very critical of the courage culture online because by telling people that the only thing standing between you and this great autonomous life is just the courage to stick up and say no to your boss and, and reject the status quo, by telling people that, you're ignoring the goal, the role that career capital plays. And you're going to convince a lot of people to try to jump into these lifestyles before they have the career capital to back it up. And the, the result is almost always disastrous. I profiled this young woman in my book who dropped out of college to go pursue sort of vaguely speaking, I'll just live off of my blog without really thinking about it. And she ended up in a really bad way because yeah. um, obviously that didn't succeed. She had no income coming in. And without a college degree, it was very hard for her to actually uh, find a job now that she saw that this wasn't working out. That's what happens. It's not harmless to say, just be bold, you know, seize the day. Yeah. You got it. The status quo is terrible. It's, it's all it takes is just a little bit of courage and your yeah. life's going to be better. It's yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Don't follow the sheep. That's the only thing like, you know. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about the status quo <laughs> is that a lot of things that have a lot of structure and that we thumb our nose at uh, are actually fantastic skill building experiences. Yeah. Pe people will look at college and say, ah. Oh, so status quo, so normal, I don't need college, but it actually uh, forces you to build a lot of skills. People will look at grades and say, oh, I don't need grades. It's all like extrinsic motivation. But hey, what happens when uh, you have to fight to get an A on a problem set because you think you need this A for to get a job down the road? That actually forces you to do really hard thinking on this mathematics concept, and you're going to end up learning that mathematics. I mean, this stuff actually works pretty well. I mean, I, I agree that you shouldn't be a sheep. Uh, but there's a lot of structures out there in the status quo that actually do a pretty good job of helping people build skills and gain more control over their life. Okay. Well, so on the flip side, though, um, you talk about – so some some people make the jump uh, for more control too early. But then there's some people who they're at a point in their career or in their job where they could um, get more control, right? Um, but there's going to be resistance either from uh, bosses or from customers – uh, because people don't like giving up control. Yeah, this so, is where yeah, yeah I was, this is where courage is relevant. Is is not early where, where courage becomes relevant is where you actually have the career capital uh, to start transforming your career to have more of these good traits. That's where you really need courage because that's where you're going to get a lot of pressure. Uh, from your current boss or from society or whatever it is to stick with whatever route is best for them. And so courage is important, but it's not important when you're 21 and just started your new blog. Courage is important when you're 25 and the blog is very successful 
and your boss is saying, no, 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 I'll give you a promotion. You got to stay here. You'll get this respect and, and trying to make, you know, do I really want to leverage this capital? That's when uh, things get tough and where courage is important. Okay. So th- you mentioned throughout the um, our conversation about the importance of mission, right? And this is something that has vexed me for a long time, um, trying to figure out like what my mission is because all right, like I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey, seven habits of highly effective people. And he's sort of the guy that popularized this idea that you should have a mission statement about your life, about your work that sort of guides you and gives you meaning. Um, the problem I found though, with like writing, I'll, I'll write the mission statement, but then like, I don't really like live it. And I think you sort of address this in your book that it's, it's hard to cultivate a mission before you actually sort of know what you're doing, if that makes sense. Is that, is that, did that, is that the kind of the point you were making that you have to kind of get going with your, your career before you can start developing that overarching mission that will drive you for the rest of your life? Yeah. So, so a mission, which I define to be an organizing principle for your whole working life, um, that can provide a real sense of passion. It's not necessary there's, there's plenty of people who, uh, who do build up passion without a mission, but it, it is a, a good strategy for, for having passion in your life. And a lot of people who, who love to work in life have missions. And how you summarized it is exactly right. It turns out for various reasons when you study um, missions in the real world, uh, study people who have these uh, career organizing you know, goals, what you find is it's almost impossible to identify a good mission until you're really good at something. Uh, so to try to sit there at the very beginning, before, early in your career, or before you even start a career and say, I'm going to figure out my mission, uh, you can come up with something, but it's almost definitely not going to be sustainable. It's, it's, it's probably going to fall apart. So in other words, even for something like mission, there's no shortcut to first building up a lot of career capital. You really Almost everything good in the career space follows from first getting really good at things. Yeah, yeah, that that was that really uh, late, you know, enlightened me a bit because that's something I've just I've I've struggled. And I've brought this question to, to people before, where you read like the self help books and the self improvement books, and they're like, yeah, you gotta have a mission, mission, mission. I'm like, yeah, I've tried this before, and it's like it doesn't like it doesn't work. Like I'll write the thing, and then like it doesn't resonate, or it just I don't I forget about it, and. Because I, I never like in my experience and throughout in life, it's like I if I join an organization that already has a predetermined mission, whether that's a job or like a football team or like, you know, at my church, they say, here's the mission this is what we're trying to do. I'm like, I'm all on board. Like, OK, yeah, we're going to do that. But when then I try to do it myself, it, it's I don't know. It's like it's hard. And I, but I think what what it was holding me back was a preventing me to like living that mission was that I was trying to start before I had gotten started, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely what's happening. Until you're uh, at the cutting edge of a field, until you 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 immersed yourself in a field, it's just really difficult to actually come up with a, a, a good, sustainable, impressive but tractable mission. You know, it's you, you focus first on doing what you do well, uh, and then it'll rise sort of unexpectedly, right? Yeah. It's, it's, that's how this really happens. It's just, you, you're doing something, you're going along, you're starting to make some progress, you're starting to get some skills. And at some point, something comes up, and you're like, you know what, this is a real problem that I could solve. And then that changes everything. So yeah, this is kind of recap. So finding meaningful work, work that you're passionate about, cultivating it, uh, be good at something, develop mastery, be autonomous, find autonomy, and develop career cap- capital, and then eventually develop um, a mission? That kind of- yeah, except for I would order it this way. So okay. uh, <laughs> this is my computer scientist mind. Okay, yeah. Right. We okay, so the algorithm is, would be as follows. The build, uh, you build career capital by becoming good at things, becoming rare, mastering rare and valuable skills. Then you can invest that capital into the traits we talked about, uh, like mastery, like mission, like autonomy. Uh, those are all things you can get once you're really good at something and are hard to have in your working life before. So it's this notion of build capital and then invest. And you have to do both. Um, so if you just get really good at something but never leverage that, then you could still be miserable. Mm-hmm. And if you know what you want in your working life but never get good enough to back it up, you can also end up miserable. You really got to have both those steps. Gotcha. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you develop, you know, use these tips in your own work? Because uh, you're a professor at Georgetown. You're an academic. Mm-hmm. Um, so you didn't you didn't decide to become a an independent loca- location independent blogger, even though you have a blog. Um, so what did how did you apply these principles in your own line of work? 
Well, a couple things are important. First, I didn't sweat the decision. So when it came down to decide what do I want to do after college, I had various options. Uh, Having long internalized these concepts, I realized that that choice was not that important. Uh, You know, what, what, Whatever I chose to do, I could transform it into something I loved. What really mattered was what happened once I got started. So the, the first thing I did is I didn't sweat the match because I didn't think there was one right thing for me to do. Uh, so computer science, uh, a career in academia, it's difficult, but it, it had some, some big potential uh, for crafting a cool life. So I said, let me try that. Uh, and then I've been very patient is what I would say. I mean, I, I have absolutely noticed that as I get better at being a computer scientist, I like it more and more. You know, my passion for this field is growing along with my skill because as I get better, I can get more of these traits, autonomy and mastery, impact, and even mission. Mission, I'm only now, you know, missions are common in academia. They're so hard. I've been at this, I've been paid to do computer science for a decade at this point. And and only now am I starting to pull together what might be a sustainable mission for my academic career. That's after a decade of <laughs> working really hard on this. So it's it's a lot of patience and a lot of just... Let me get better. Where can I get better? Am I pushing my skills forward? And, and you know, that's working for me. And my passion and my love for my work has really grown over the years. And it had nothing to do with following some mystical pre-existing passion. I think that's awesome. So I think that's great advice for our listeners who are, you know, making those career decisions. Don't, don't sweat it too much. Just keep developing that career capital and be patient and things will happen for you if you keep Keep you keep you got to keep working at. It. I'm not saying it's going to magically happen, but you got to things will happen if you keep developing that career capital, becoming better. You'll eventually find work, or not find, cultivate work you love. It's absolutely right. I love that. I think it's fantastic advice. Well, Cal Newport, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. Uh, before we go, where can people find out more about your work? Uh, CalNewport.com. You can find out about my books. You can find my blog. You might have a hard time contacting me. I don't use social media and I'm <laughs> wary of email, but uh, you can certainly buy my book and read my stuff. Fantastic. Well, Calvin Newport, thank you for so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Brett. Our guest today was Cal Newport. Cal is the author of So Good They Can't Ignore You, Why Skills Trump Passion and the Quest for Work You Love. Uh, this is one of my favorite books I've read so far this year. Definitely recommend you go pick it up, especially if you're in college or are the beginning of your career. Even if you're in the middle of your career, go pick up a copy because you're going to get something from it. Really great stuff. You can also check out Cal's website or Cal's blog, calnewport.com. Again, lots of great information, especially about studying and deliberate practice and deep thinking and deep learning. Really, really great stuff. So go check it out, calnewport.com. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And again, if you enjoy this free podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you go to iTunes or Stitcher or whatever it is you use to listen to your podcast and give us a review. I don't care what it is, just yeah, just a review of some sort. And also, if you like it, please tell your friends about us. Uh, that would help us out a lot. So until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Stay manly.